All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our June of 2021 Global One Health Initiative webinar supported by the NIH Fogarty International Center. Our theme for this webinar will be One Health Policy and Implementation, and we will be hearing from Dr. Laura Khan from Princeton University and Dr. Mazaret Bekele from the Ethiopian Ministry of Agriculture. So after both of our speakers have presented, we will have a panel discussion. So please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. And I would like to go ahead and begin by briefly introducing our first speaker, Dr. Laura Khan. So Dr. Laura Khan is a physician and research scholar with the Program on Science and Global Security at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Health and International Affairs at Princeton University in New Jersey. She is a leader in One Health practice, having published a paper that helped launch the One Health Initiative. In 2005, she organized a conference at Princeton University on zoonotic diseases and the need to integrate human and animal public health infrastructure to enable effective responses to bioterrorism and pandemics. She was also co-director and lecturer for the course Zoonoses, an Emerging Public Health Issue for graduate and medical students at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. And Dr. Khan has also published the books titled Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics, Bioterror Attacks, and Other Public Health Crises in 2009, and One Health and the Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance in 2016. She also frequently writes online columns for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and has published in many peer-reviewed journals. And her course titled Hogs, Bats, and Ebola, An Introduction to One Health Policy, won the Princeton University 205th Anniversary Fund for Innovation in Undergraduate Education. And Dr. Khan holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of California, Los Angeles, an, an MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, a Master's of Public Health from Columbia University, and a Master's of Public Policy from Princeton. And she has received numerous awards and recognitions, including the American Veterinary Epidemiology Society's highest honor, the K.F. Meyer James H. Steele Gold Head Cane Award for her work in One Health. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Laura. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I cannot go into um, regular um, presentation mode. Uh, because then my computer freezes up. So uh, my apologies for that. So I'm going to talk with you this uh, today, uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are, uh, to give you a One Health perspective of food security, emerging zoonotic diseases, and antimicrobial resistance in the 21st century. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with One Health, it's simply the concept that human, animal, plant, environmental and ecosystem health are linked. And this, this um, concept provides a very useful framework for examining and addressing complex issues that we're dealing with today. And it's very important to identify the root causes of many of these events, uh, such as spillover events or antimicrobial resistance, um, if we are to develop effective policies to address them. And I think it's important to remember that people interact with their environment every day by inhaling air, drinking fluids, and ingesting the plants and animals that we call food. And this is the One Health Initiative website that my colleagues and I run. Uh, please visit it. It's a labor of love for us, and uh, we get very happy when people visit our uh, our website. So now when I talk about One Health serving as a framework, what exactly does that mean? And how can that be useful at, the, at different levels? So um, I've been working on developing a multi-dimensional matrix or a cube, if you will, to, uh, to serve as such a framework. So the first dimension would be the One Health factors 
and that's humans, animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems. The second dimension would be complexity factors, and that's microbial, individual, and population. The third dimension are the political, social, and economic factors, and you, that can be represented by political borders, local and regional, national, international, and global. Now, I realize I'm trying to represent three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. So if we convert that into a cube, uh, you could see that, and I'm using uh, a Rubik's cube here, so it only gives me three sides. Um, humans, animals, plants could be inserted, environments and ecosystems. Ideally, we'd have five uh, little blocks uh, and they would intersect with the complexity factors. Uh, and then they would intersect with the social, economic uh, and political factors. So that each little square then gives you a, uh, this matrix to, um, to examine and to study. Um, the fourth dimension, which I'm not representing here, would be time. And that could be either days, months, years, decades, or even eras, uh, depending on your needs. So I'm using this now when I investigate various One Health issues. Uh, and this is, again, a work in progress that um, I'm eager to share with, with you. So let's briefly talk about food security, um, agriculture and the food security that it provides is the foundation of civilization. Food security uh, essentially means no hungry people. Uh, and it is uh, defined by the World Food Summit as existing when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. It's built on three pillars, availability, access and use. And it is so important that uh, food security is number two or zero hunger in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, unfortunately, in 2020, there are many regions of the world, many countries where there's still a lot of hungry people. Uh, and while the US is a monolithic blue, uh, we certainly have our share of hungry people too. So there's plenty of hungry people not only in the, um, these uh, low and middle income countries, but also in other countries as well, the higher income as well. So why is food security so important? Well, what, first of all, we have to recognize that climate change is going to have a profound impact on food production and governments then have to implement policies to maximize food security and food safety. They have an incentive to do this because when food security breaks down, uh, you begin to see uh, an unraveling of civil society, uh, perhaps even revolution. And the question we all have to ask and which One Health has to answer is how can everyone be fed without destroying the planet's biosphere or the global sum of all ecosystems? <clears throat> now the United Nations, uh, the, the World Bank in 2010 did some climate modeling and they estimated that in 2050, which is really only 30 years from now, due to climate change effect, uh, effects, um, assuming current agricultural practices and crop varieties stay the same, much of the world is going to become too hot and too dry to grow food and the yields are going to drop substantially in many parts of the world. So we have to recognize the threats that we face and currently our trajectory in terms of achieving the Paris Climate Agreement uh, goals, we are far from achieving that. So let me briefly now talk about animal proteins because they're tied in with all of this. And um, there are uh, many different regions, countries where meat consumption varies. Uh, and of course, some of the uh, high income countries have some of the highest meat consumption per capita, as, as you can see. Uh, India notably has uh, the highest fraction of vegetarians in the world, but even there, the uh, demand for animal proteins is increasing. Now there are pros and cons to eating meat. 
Uh, certainly for the pro side, meat provides very important micronutrients such as vitamin B12 and iron. In fact, there's even evidence that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. And eating meat is an integral part of many religions and cultures. But on the other hand, if we look at the cons, uh, meat's not essential uh, if you supplement it with the vitamin B12 and other important micronutrients. Raising domesticated animals and or hunting wild animals contaminates the environment and reduces biodiversity, and most notably, it increases zoonotic spillover risks. And uh, we've had lots of uh, spillover events uh, over the past uh, decades, um, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but certainly many of them are tied either directly or indirectly with humanity's uh, interactions with animals, either wild or domestic, either the capture uh, trade of wild animals or the raising uh, production and consumption of domesticated animals. So the question we must ask then in the event of uh, something such as SARS or MERS uh, or, or perhaps even COVID, should the wildlife trade and live animal markets be banned? And if so, how could that be enforced? Because as the demand continues, it's very hard to enforce these types of policies. But it's important to recognize that the political implications of food insecurity are profound. And when you see high food prices, uh, again, that leads to civil unrest and civilization starts to break down. So uh, let me now switch gears and talk a bit about antimicrobial resistance because this is very much a One Health issue and tied in with food. Uh, again, humans, animals, plants, I did not list plants here because I'm not going to talk about it, but that is certainly part of this equation. Environments and ecosystems is a One Health issue. Now, when I look at the, uh, that uh, multidimensional matrix, that cube, if we take just one little part of the cube um, and we look at animals, humans, or plants at the local regional level, looking at microbial, um, you can see that um, our bodies are mostly microbial. We live in a microbial world. And indeed, our microbes that live on us and in us are as important for our health and well being as any of our organs. Uh, and same for animals and plants. The phytobiome, the animal microbiomes are also equally important for their health and well being. And we have to recognize that microbes made our planet habitable by releasing oxygen. Uh, you had uh, microalgae releasing oxygen. Uh, in, from the oceans. So um, we are, our whole very existence really relies on uh, the presence of microbes. Um, so when we use antibiotics, um, unfortunately, they indiscriminately kill off the good microbes with the bad, particularly the broad spectrum uh, antibiotics. And I highly uh, recommend this book, The Missing Microbes by Martin Blazer, who's an infectious disease physician who's been studying uh, the uh, effects of antibiotics on uh, the uh, human microbiome for many years. Um, it's, this science is still very much in its infancy. Another portion of the One Health Cube looking at environments and ecosystems at the microbial level at the international global level, um, scientists have called uh, antimicrobial resistance as part of the global resistome because it turns out from metagenomic studies where they extract DNA directly from the soil that antibiotic resistance genes are ancient and they're everywhere. Uh, and so what, and, and it predates certainly human anthropogenic use. So we have to recognize that, um, that antimicrobial resistance is not going away. Uh, and we need to figure out how to work with nature 
not against nature if we want to continue to have uh, an ability to treat my, uh, infections, uh, especially since many of our antibiotics come from soil microbes. So how are humans adversely impacting the global resistome or the global sum of all antimicrobial resistance? Well, through poor sanitation, indiscriminate antibiotic use in humans, animals on, on agriculture, uh, untreated human and animal waste that uh, contaminates environments and ecosystems, and the spread of resistant microbes and resistance genes by wildlife because they can pick it up. I think it's also important to recognize that um, humans, there's now 7.8 billion humans and according to FAO, there's now 33 billion food animals. We now constitute about 96 to 98% of the global terrestrial mammalian biomass on the planet. And indeed, there are now more broiler chickens. The combined mass exceeds all other birds on earth with a standing population of about 23 billion birds. This was an extremely important study by uh, Berendus, the estimation of global recoverable human and animal fecal biomass. Uh, Berendus and his colleagues estimated, and this was done in 2014, that of the 7.4 billion humans and 30 billion domesticated food animals produce about 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter. And this was in 2014 and animals produce 80% of it, but our sanitation systems process human waste, not animal waste. Uh, and so um, we don't really pay a lot of attention of the impact of animal waste on foodborne and waterborne illnesses, on the spread of antimicrobial resistance and the contamination of our environments, global environments and ecosystems. Uh, and just a, a very um, intriguing observation, um, when you look at the maps that were generated by this study, and you can see that certain countries such as Australia and New Zealand have very high animal to human fecal uh, ratio, fecal mass ratio, because they have more sheep than humans. Um, you look at the global antibiotic consumption, this was 2000 to 2010 by uh, Van Bogle and colleagues. Uh, and it's interesting that Australia and New Zealand had some of the highest antibiotic use per capita of any other country. Uh, and perhaps that has some relationship to the high animal to human fecal matter that's in the environment. I don't know, it's just a very intriguing observation, but we really need to have more studies looking at the potential role of animal fecal matter on human disease, certainly on foodborne illness and on other, uh, dis uh, other infectious diseases. Um, just to give you an idea of how much 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter there are, you can fill over 1.6 million Olympic sized swimming pools with it. Or to put it another way, you can cover the entire surface area of Los Angeles in New York under six feet of fecal matter, the entire sur surface area of both. And we are increasing our uh, production of it each year. Uh, this not only uh, affects human, I mean, our individual health, but global health as well. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So uh, again, one portion of the cube, environments, ecosystems, looking local, regionally at populations, um, you can see that you get, you increase the risk then of foodborne and waterborne illnesses uh, from fecal contamination and when people get sick, they take antibiotics and the antibiotic resistance increases and this cycle continues on and on. Uh, not only that, but as the climate worsens and we get more storms, um, you can see that we run the risk of flooding of some of these fecal, these manure lagoons uh, that can then contaminate 
uh, local regions and adversely impacting human and animal health. Now again, environments, ecosystems, populations at the international global level, I had alluded to that in a bit, but this uh, animal manure uh, produces some of the most potent greenhouse gases uh, around. They are major emitters of methane and nitrous oxide. Now, carbon dioxide has what's called a uh, global, has a uh, greenhouse uh, gas equivalent of one. Methane is about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. And nitrous oxide uh, is about 200, is over 260 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So these are extremely potent greenhouse gases that last for about a century. Carbon dioxide lasts for thousands of years in the environment. So whatever we're pumping into the environment of carbon dioxide is not going away for thousands of years. And certainly methane and nitrous oxide is gonna continue for all of our lifespans. Um, in terms of methane and nitrous oxide emissions, manure is a major part of that. For nitrous oxide, putting manure or a high nitrogen fertilizer on agricultural soils is the biggest contributor of nitrous oxide emissions. Serious, serious problem that's generally being ignored. Uh, we cannot do that if we want to uh, minimize the impact of climate change. There are strategies to reduce methane and nitrous oxide uh, emissions in manure management, the way manure is stored and handled, capturing uh, methane as a biogas uh, in terms of soil management, using low nitrogen fertilizers and other strategies. Um, but I think what I'm hope to have shown you in this talk that from a One Health perspective of food security, climate change, animal proteins through the production of uh, livestock, emerging diseases, antimicrobial resistance, they are all connected and they are all multidimensional and we have to look at it in a systems perspective if we want to develop effective policies to uh, reduce their deleterious impacts. So again, filling out this One Health Cube, looking at the uh, complexity factors, the One Health factors, the political social factors, you can fill in the cube. So uh, in summary then, we are adversely impacting our microbial world uh, through many different means, particularly through our wastes and our fecal wastes. Um, and so we must figure out how to feed ourselves sustainably to maintain civilization on a hotter and drier planet without unleashing more deadly diseases upon ourselves. And we need to integrate our efforts. And I think one of the best ways to do it is using a multidimensional One Health matrix or a cube, which can really help to identify, hone in on some of these issues then allowing policymakers to approach these complex issues systematically and comprehensively. Uh, and with that, I'd like to um, just recognize my colleagues with the One Health Initiative. Uh, for those who wanna learn more about One Health, I have a, a, a six week or six session uh, free online Coursera course, Bats, Ducks and Pandemics an introduction to One Health policy where I go into these issues in much more detail. Uh, this is free and online and uh, please uh, check it out and tell your friends and colleagues who might be interested to check it out. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention and look forward to uh, any uh, the, the Q&A session. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for your wonderful and insightful presentation. And um, I would like to now introduce our second speaker, Dr. Mezaret Bekele. So Dr. Mezaret Bekele is the director of the Veterinary Public Health Directorate of the Ethiopian Ministry of Agriculture and a PhD fellow with the International Livestock Research Institute. 
She graduated from Addis Ababa University with a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and a Master's of Science in Veterinary Public Health. In her role as Director of the Veterinary Public Health Directorate, she's considered the leading expert working on zoonotic disease prevention and control, as well as food safety and quality control activities at the federal level in Ethiopia. Additionally, she serves as a chairwoman and sec sec sorry, secretary for the National One Health Steering Committee and the Rabies Technical Working Group. Previously, she worked with the Ethiopian Ministry of Agriculture as a senior zoonotic disease prevention and control expert in the Veterinary Public Health Directorate, as well as a senior expert at special support regions. And prior to that, Dr. Mesret worked as an instructor at the Alagay Technical and Vocational Education Training College, teaching different animal health courses. So Dr. Mesret, please feel free to begin your presentation whenever you are ready. Thank you, Laura, for a nice uh, briefing and introduction. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, so I will try to uh, share my experience on the National One uh, String Committee or coordination mechanism in Ethiopia. So I have a few. Uh, presentation outline and I will briefly uh, 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 touch all this uh, outline and uh, I will uh, start with the introduction part, but uh, Dr. Laura Khan is briefly saying all about the WANELS, the definition and the importance and the challenge. So. May I uh, pass this introduction part or and directly go to the National One Health Steering Committee or shall I proceed with my presentation, Laura? Um, as you wish, um, either way is fine. If you, if you wanna skim over briefly what you have there or jump either way is okay. fine. Okay, okay. I'll, I will uh, begin with the introduction. As you know, uh, today the convergence and interaction of uh, people, animal, and our environment has created a new dynamics in which the health of each group is inextricably interconnected and totally dependent. And the challenges associated with this uh, dynamic are demanding the multi-sectoral and multi-disciplinary uh, uh, collaboration. And at the same time, new opportunities have emerging to uh, protect and promote health in the rapidly changing human and animal and environmental domain. So the key strategy to better understanding and addressing the contemporary health issue created by the convergence of human animal environmental interfaces, adopting the mindsets and requisite action that underpin the concept of one health. So uh, to define the WANELS, I, uh, I know you uh, know and implementing WANELS better than me. So uh, the definition for WANELS is the collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health for people, animal, plant, and our environment. So this WANELS uh, recognize that the health of human, animal, and the uh, ecosystems are uh, interconnected and also involves applying a coordinated, collaborated, collaborative and multidisciplinary and cross-sectoral approach to address potential or existing risk that originate at the animal-human ecosystem interface. So the One Health aims is to improve the health and well-being through the prevention of risks and the mitigation of effects of crisis that originate at the interface between these groups, human, animal, and their various environments. So when we see uh, the spillover of the pathogen, 
So uh, the, the interface between the human, animal, and the environment, there is no any boundary. So pathogen can spill over from the environment to the domestic animals and from domestic animals to the human population or directly from the in the wild animals to pe people or from people to uh, the animals. So when we come to the factors and uh, of this uh, zoonotic disease or uh, the factors of emerging and re-emerging one of the issues, around 60% of existing human infection diseases are zoonotic. That is, uh, we have uh, more than 1,000 450 infectious diseases. Out of this, around 849 infection diseases are uh, zoonotics. This is the fact. And we have 75% uh, of emerging infectious diseases of human are originated from uh, animals. And every year, five new human diseases are appear. And from that, three are of animal origin. And from this zoonotic pathogen, around 80% of agents are used for uh, potential bioterrorists. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Laura uh, says, the antimicrobial uh, resistance is increasing at an alarming rate. So these are the factors we have in the emerging and uh, re-emerging of uh, one uh, issues. Also, there are drivers like population growth, uh, global warming and uh, climate change, as well uh, travel and trades are the drivers for the, pre the presence of this emerging and re-emerging one as issues. So cognizant of this one health approach is now uh, needed to consider, study and plan integrated strategies for other health treat across human, animal, and the environment. So new treats and risks to health of unprecedented scope and scale and with potential global economic devastation much greater than experienced during any previous time in the history are like to emerging at any time. We can uh, uh, say uh, as an example, uh, Ebola, SARS, MERS-CoV, and the current novel coronavirus pandemic, the COVID-19. So what is the solution? The solution is the sector should, uh, the individual sector should not be seen uh, individually or should not work individually, rather they should uh, work in alliance in one health approach in animal, human, and environmental sectors. Also, it is more efficient to manage emerging and re-emerging health streets at a source rather than after the spillover. So by uh, saying this about uh, WANES, now uh, I will try to uh, take you to the WANES initiative in Ethiopia. So in Ethiopia, uh, uh, past two decades, there are different uh, hard work uh, activities, WANES activities. So these activities are uh, those uh, cross-sectoral activities are, uh, has, uh, has been limited in their uh, life span, as well as in, uh, they are specific in their scopes. And uh, they are uh, disbounded after the uh, cause or the treats are uh, contained or uh, reduced. So we can mention uh, some of these uh, Hadouk uh, activities like the multidisciplinary team to identify the cause of unknown liver disease in Chigrai 2005. And in 2006 also, there is a national coordination committee for highly pathogenic avian influenza. This committee was uh, led by the deputy prime minister. But after uh, containing or identifying the issues, this uh, committee and the team are disbanded. And the other initiative we have is a uh, project uh, funded or uh, initiative like we have OSHAN in 2010. These are based in uh, universities like Macaulay University, Jumma University and Addis Ababa University. Their activities is on 
uh, workforce development on one else. And there are also uh, a project in Jijiga University, which we call the One Health Jijiga Initiative. It is between the uh, Ahiri and the Jijiga University. So there are also other different uh, uh, HADOC One Health activities and projects, but currently we have a, a government uh, oriented uh, string committee level. One Health, uh, One Health initiative that we call it National One Health Steering Committee. And the main purpose of my presentation is focus on this steering committee. So the steering committee is established in August 16, uh, 2016. And the committee member is comprised of four key government sectors and uh, like Minister of Health, represented by the EPHI, Ethiopian Public Health Institute, Minister of uh, Livestock and Fishery, at that time it was uh, Livestock, now it's become uh, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Culture and Tourism, because at that time the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority is under the Minister of uh, Culture and Tourism, Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, now it's become the Commission, and now the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority is under the Environment Forest Climate Change Commission. These are the key govern government sector, which are a voting member for the string committee. We do have also a member, which is non-voting member, that is the partners. So in the partners, the members are USAID, FAO, CDC, OSHA uh, Global One Health Initiative, uh, Ohio State University, uh, John Hopkins uh, Center for uh, Communication, and Core Group, Hillary, VSF, Hill Project, WHO, and others. This project and development partners are member for the National One Health String Committee, but they are non voting. And in this uh, committee, four person from each institution are officially assigned. And uh, we have around 16 officially assigned members of voting and uh, partners are almost there. Depending on the project uh, year, they will uh, be uh, staying with us or when the project is phased out, they will uh, leave the members. So the National One String Committee mandates is to facilitate multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration among one of the stakeholders at national and sub-national, we call it regional uh, level, and strive towards the establishment of sustainable and institutionalized one health platform in the country. As the name indicates, it is a string committee not an uh, institutionalized one. So this is mandated, uh, the committee is mandated to facilitate the establishment of sustainable and institutionalized one health platform in the, in the country. So under the National One Health Stream Committee, we do have different technical working group. These technical working groups are envis envisaged to provide expert forum for tackling zoonotic disease, enhances mutual accountability, and collaboration among the sector and promotes greater efficiencies in the management of zoonotic disease and other health threats using one health approach in the country. So the technical working group we do have uh, currently is the Rebus technical working group, the Anthrax technical working group, the Emerging Pandemic Treat technical working group, the One Health Communication Task Force, the uh, brucellosis technical working group and the antimicrobial task force. These are uh, the technical working group under the umbrella of National One Health Steering Committee. They are existing at national level. This uh, National Steering uh, Committee accomplished some uh, uh, key milestones. So I will briefly uh, talk on this uh, milestone. This photograph is during the establishment of uh, our uh, National One Steering Committee during uh, August 2016. There, Her Excellency Dr. Musak, State Minister from Ministry of Agriculture, 
Mr. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Kumara Wakajira, the General Director for the uh, Iuka, uh, Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority. Also, there are uh, officials from health and other different stakeholders and partners. These are the picture, the first. The key uh, accomplishment or milestones we had, uh, we have, uh, by, we had by my, the National Wildlife Stream Committee, we endorsed the Memorandum of Understanding for the WANEL's activities. So in this Memorandum of Understanding, from Minister of Health, uh, uh, Dr. Kabeda uh, Werko, State Minister, is signed for Minister of Health. For Minister of Agriculture, uh, um, Dr. Misrak Makonan, State Minister. And for uh, Tourism, uh, Minister of Tourism and uh, Culture, uh, the IUCA, the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation uh, Authority, General Director, Kumara Wakjira, signed for the Environment uh, Minister, uh, the Minister uh, Gamedo, uh, Dr. Gamedo Dali signed it and endorsed it. So we do have uh, M MOU, uh, MOU. Uh, and we have a different uh, strategy document developed. So this strategy document were uh, endorsed in 2018 in presence of uh, the state minister, Dr. Gabriel Xavier, uh, the deputy uh, director for it, uh, it, uh, Ethiopian Public Health Institute. Currently, he uh, became a deputy. At that time, he was advisor for the Ministry of Health, uh, Mr. Aschaulau, the general director, Shifra And from IUCA, we endorsed this uh, strategy document on, uh, on, uh, in 2018. Also, we developed uh, a message guide for priority zoonotic disease. So uh, in Ethiopia, uh, for two times, we prioritized zoonotic disease. One in during 2016, and we prioritized five zoonotic diseases like rabies, anthrax, uh, brucella, leptospirosis, and echinococcosis. In the second round of prioritization in 2020, we prioritized Again, rabies, anthrax, brucellosis, and sorry, and uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza and uh, Rift Valley fever. So this message guide will uh, is developed for those priority zoonotic diseases. There are also other uh, achievement which is not endorsed yet, but it is on its final stage. So we develop a preparedness and response plan for highly pathogenic avian influenza and a contingency plan for Rift Valley fever. Also the brucellosis prevention and control strategy is almost uh, finalized, but it uh, needs the endorsement. All these final stage documents are uh, only left endorsement of uh, the strategy by respected uh, institution or ministries. Also, we drafted the One Health uh, Communication Strategy and also the National Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Prevention and Containment Strategy is in the third version is now in a review process. Like the other as achievement, like we established the regional or sub-national One Health Task Force in seven regions or seven, seven national uh, part of uh, Ethiopia, like in Somali region, uh, Gambella region, Amara region, Benishangul region, uh, Chigrai region, Oromia and South region. So we uh, uh, establish the one task force in this region and uh, some of they are active, some they need still uh, attention from the uh, higher official or the government. The other, we do a uh, joint surveillance, a uh, joint outbreak surveillance, like the Rift Valley fever, when there is uh, an outbreak in a uh, bordering country, we uh, um, uh, create a team from different uh, sectors and discipline 
and they went for the uh, surveillance and they bring their data and we do the after action review. Also in rabies outbreak and unknown camel days in Somali and wild bird days in uh, southern part of Ethiopia. Also, there are different capacity building on workforce development. So we give different capacity and we take different capacity buildings, both for federal and subnational level uh, experts. So uh, different uh, projects, projects and the government uh, development partner provide us different capacity building uh, trainings. When we say the challenges and uh, uh, challenges encountered during implementing WANELS in Ethiopia by the National WANELS Steering Committee, uh, though the WANELS is mandatory and its benefits is obvious, it is uh, entangled or uh, noted with various challenges, like the most of the challenges are, uh, I stated here, like limited awareness and uh, a recognition to WANA's initiative in Ethiopia by the policymakers. The policymakers, uh, even they didn't recognize the WANA's initiatives in Ethiopia, some of them. Also, the awareness level of the policymakers about the WANA's is uh, very low and limited. The other uh, challenge we have uh, is uh, limited attention and effort to WANELS due to the competing priority. Since each uh, sector ministry has its own priority, so they give the priority for their own sector specific activity rather than giving attention to the WANELS, be it in uh, technical or financially. The other one is high uh, staff turnover because there are uh, whenever there is a new staff joining the steering committee or a new officials joining the ministries or the uh, or the ministers or the authorities, they don't know the the they lack the awareness of the owner. So to aware the, them, it needs uh, it takes uh, a time to to aware them and to get their attention to the one health so that our planning, our plans will be lagging behind, behind with time uh, by doing the awareness on the newly uh, joining the staffs or the higher official. So uh, we have uh, difficulties in this uh, turnover of the officials and the staffs. The other one is uh, there is no legally recognized uh, one health coordination offices or structures in Ethiopia. So this is the one is the big challenge we faced in our implementation. The other one is a COVID-19 pandemic situation. In, in COVID pandemic, uh, pandemic situation, there is uh, restrictions for the prevention of the situation. So due to this uh, pandemic, there are some activities that are, that are pending. So these are the major uh, challenges we encounter during our implementation of finance. So uh, I'm coming to my conclusion. So Ethiopia has made a tremendous uh, progress. So it is, uh, National uh, One uh, Steering Committee, but even if Ethiopia uh, made a huge uh, step in uh, cap uh, capacitating the or strengthening the animal and human uh, health service, uh, still there is a cross sectoral effort to prevent, detect, and respond to One Health Street are still at juvenile uh, stage. So my uh, Way forward is, I uh, have two way forward. One is a recognition of, to the National One as the Steering Committee by the Ministry Office, officials. And the second one is, and the big, we need uh, this one, guidance and support to establish institutionalization, uh, institutionalized, uh, institutionalized One Health platform or coordination structure in the country. So by this, I will end uh, my uh, presentation. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Vazarez. And I think we can go ahead and begin our panel discussion and we will have Dr. Getnet Yimmer leading our um, panel discussion. Um, so um, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Getnet, but um, I have a question myself. So um, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Uh... Indeed, those our speakers for sharing us your invaluable wisdom on, on one hand from both, you know, the US and, and from Ethiopia. Indeed, it uh, was such a, an amazing discussion and, and uh, we have a lot to learn. Dr. Laura, I can't wait to go ahead and jump into the, the free, you know, the documentation and the teaching material that you have, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm really eager to look into it and also to share to a wider audience. And uh, again, Perfect. yeah, so uh, perhaps before I, I give the chance to others, including Laura Benkley, uh, and again, appreciation, uh, Dr. Masarat for, for, yeah, for sharing your knowledge. And let me start uh, by throwing a couple of questions to, to both of you. The first one is, uh, let me start from the last piece where Dr. Masaret indicated the first challenge that they have in uh, implementing One Health is the limited awareness by policymakers. And I'm assuming that Dr. Laura, based on your experience in the US, because you have worked a lot One Health and policy, if there is any advice that may work for LMICs in terms of increasing knowledge and engagement among the policymakers. So what advice you may have for the Ethiopian One Health Committee so that you know, the policymakers ministers will be convinced. That's the first one. The second one for you again, Dr. Laura, is a, a wonderful narration about, you know, talking about the admission on the AMR and, you know, uh, taking us way back in, in history. And something that I, I want you to reflect on is also in for the future. What do you think? I mean, AMR and the future. We have a little to it a little bit, but I really want to hear more about so much as you emphasized about the initiant and what happened on the future aspect as well. The other minor uh, reflection that uh, might be nice to hear from you, again, for Dr. Laura, is you indicated that the sanitation system is taking care of the human and not the animal waste, which I suppose is in developed countries. In LMICs, both the human and the animal waste is not, you know, the sanitation system may not, so it's, it's a devil burden. And if you have few words to reflect on that combining you know the animal and the human waste and the sanitation system on that piece uh dr masarat a couple of things for you as well so much as you mentioned the one health platform worked very well among the different stakeholders and ministries in ethiopia which is what we really need do you also want in the Q presentation by Dr. Laura, we, we saw that, you know, regional, global, beyond the country is something important. And most of these emerging, re-emerging pathogens go beyond one country. So I, I really want your, to hear your reflection, Dr. Masarat, be it at the technical working group level or at the One Health National Steering Committee level. If you have had interaction with the neighboring countries as a region, you know, with Kenya, with Somalia, with Uganda, Tanzania, so that you know we go beyond one country. That's on the upstream base, base, but also on on um, the on the other side. Country like Ethiopia and a very big country like Ethiopia, I don't think that having a one health steering committee at the national level will solve everything. You may need to cascade it to the grassroots level to the regions, you know, with 100 plus million people. Has there been any work in the regions uh, to strengthen One Health related issues as well? Perhaps 
Moving on to the last question I have uh, for you to reflect, Dr. Masarat, is, uh, I mean, we are really eager to hear on the readiness of LMICs, taking Ethiopia as an example, uh, because you really reflected on how ready are LMICs in detecting emerging and re-emerging health threat. You mentioned that we have to take it, tackle it from the source. So are we ready as a country, as a region, and any reflection on that would be great. Once we hear your reflection on those points, we'll open up, we'll be having a live and interactive section, open up for question and discussion. Colleagues on the webinar, please don't hesitate to throw questions on the chat box, Q&A box, and then we'll try to address as, as much uh, question as possible. So uh, in the order, let's give a chance to Dr. Laura first, and then followed by Dr. Masarat. The floor is yours, Dr. Laura. Thank you. Well, you, you raised some very tall questions, <laughs> easier said than answered. I mean, that's the million dollar question. How do you raise awareness among policymakers? And I'll just give you an example of what we dealt with in New Jersey. Uh, there was a One Health uh, consortium in New Jersey and uh, we worked very, very hard to get a, uh, a bill passed through both the New Jersey uh, House and legislature. And um, uh, it was to establish a One Health uh, task force in the state. Uh, it, we got it passed through lots of testimony and written, both written and oral testimony, only to have the governor veto it. Uh, because he said, this isn't a health issue, this is an agriculture issue. And it just defeated the entire purpose of all that we were trying to do. I mean, it was, it, it really seemed like it was just smooth sailing. And then it was defeated by the governor, uh, which was really devastating for us. We're not giving up, of course, but um, it just showed that the governor just didn't understand. Uh, so that's what we're up against. Uh, and this was a multidisciplinary team of physicians and veterinarians. And, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, state legislatures understood it, but the governor did not. So, so how do we move past that? Well, I, I think we really need to generate a groundswell of public support. Um, this is a situation where we have to educate the public. And that was one of my motivations for developing this Coursera course was to try and get this information out to the public. Um, most of the people who are taking the Coursera course are veterinarians. And so they're, you know, they are, they get it, they in, are interested in it. Um, getting people, the general public, or even those in the human side of the equation, uh, interested and engaged is easier said than done. Um, I will say, though, that um, as devastating as COVID-19 has been, um, that, has, that might have a silver lining in that it's forcing the public to recognize that uh, our lives are dependent on a healthy planet, healthy animals. Um, so, so there might be a, a, a silver lining to this pandemic. Uh, and I'll just give you an example that um, I teach a course at a freshman seminar at Princeton. And last spring, uh, there has to be a minimum number of students to enroll in order to have it. Uh, and it was canceled because of lack of student interest. Um, I offered it again this fall and there were 30 students who signed up because of the pandemic and they were interested. So, uh, just from my own personal experience, this pandemic has generated a tremendous amount of interest. I'm actually moderating a panel at Princeton reunions for the first time ever uh, because of this pandemic. So, um, so uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard the saying, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, we have an opportunity to to make use of this crisis and to hammer home to the public and policymakers why One Health is so important. Uh, so we really need to raise our voices collectively, 
write articles, um, contact policymakers, reach out to the public, write, uh, write uh, opinion pieces, uh, you know, get the word out. This is our opportunity to do that because there's interest now. So we need to, to strike while, while the interest continues. Um, let's see, you had some other questions about the future of antimicrobial resistance. Um, you know, the, it, the, the challenge with what we're, what, how we're addressing it, and a lot of it is um, kind of goes counter to, to human nature. You know, all of the um, antibiotic stewardship programs mean well, but withholding treatment to people who are sick and who want treatment is counterproductive in my opinion. And we really need to look at some of the upstream drivers of what's contributing to all of this. And of course, you know, the, uh, the widespread use and misuse of antibiotics and in many countries, antibiotics are used as a substitute for sanitation and hygiene and they're used as a substitute for primary care. They make it uh, available over the counter without a prescription. And so when people feel mildly sick, they just go to the pharmacy and pick up antibiotics. Um, and that of course all contributes to the problem, including of course the widespread use in animals and in crop agriculture, there's a lot of antibiotic use. And what we've discovered, what scientists have discovered, um, you know, most of what goes on under the surface of the soil is not really known. Many of the organisms are uh, um, we are unable to culture in the laboratory. And so to get around that, they very cleverly came up with this metagenomic strategy where they extract genetic material directly from the soil. And uh, they don't necessarily know from which microbe the genetic material came from, but nevertheless, they found antibiotic resistance genes everywhere. They found it in the Arctic, they found it in the Antarctic, they found it in caves that have never seen human anthropogenic exposure. Uh, so it looks like these genes, these resistance genes are ancient, they're everywhere. And what the bacteria do, which we, you know, scientists thought for many years that they used antibiotics as a form of chemical warfare against each other, but it doesn't now appear to be that. It appears that they use these chemicals to communicate with each other. And so with our blasting the environment with all of these antibiotics, the, uh, the bacteria are very nicely sharing these resistance genes with each other to protect themselves with what we're doing to the environment. So we're altering the global resistome of the planet. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we're ch changing the global microbial ecology. Uh, and they can share their resistance genes a lot faster than we can develop new antibiotics. So in a way we are uh, working against nature then and we are going to continually lose. Um, and not only that, I think one of the most unappreciated things that we are doing is the 4 trillion kilograms of fecal waste that we are producing each year. And that fecal waste serves as a perfect uh, medium for microbial gene transmission uh, and for uh, sharing, uh, mixing in with the soil microbes, uh, altering again the soil microbial ecosystem. You know, animals did not evolve to live packed by the hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands in these large um, livestock facilities. So it's, uh, it's, it's just not sustainable. Uh, and you know, when you look at the, um, the, the national antimicrobial resistance plans, uh, when you look at the WHO national or, you know, framework for antimicrobial resistance, they mention sanitation and hygiene, but sanitation systems only cover human fecal matter. There is no mention whatsoever of animal fecal matter, nothing about manure management. And of course, in many low and middle income countries, people raise animals around their homes with absolutely no knowledge of the risk of that fecal matter in their homes or around their homes. Uh, kids play in it, it gets in the food, 
Um, you know, so you, you have poor sanitation for human waste. You have no, no process for handling animal waste. And many of the microbes in animal waste are what drive foodborne and waterborne disease. So that is a huge oversight that we need to address uh, if we want to have uh, you know, a sustainable society going forward. Yeah, thanks very much, Dr. Laura. You reflected on uh, yeah, all the points I raised. Now the floor is for Dr. Masarat. Perhaps before I give you the floor, Dr. Masarat, I failed to introduce myself earlier. While you know, being impressed by your talk, Gaten Natimar is my name. I'm a physician scientist. I'm the director for the Ohio State Global One Health Initiative based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Dr. Masarat, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gatnet. I was actually going to do that as well. Um, so, we are covering that. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Gatnet, for your excellent question you raised for me. Uh, I will start uh, answering from the last question you said, and I will answer it uh, my opinion. Maybe. So uh, you are asking, uh, the last question is, uh, are we ready to detect pathogen at the source at, uh, at this level, like uh, the low middle income countries? I'm referring Ethiopia. So as you see from my conclusion, I have said already, uh, we are at juvenile uh, stage. So uh, to do that, we have uh, so many challenges, like the capacity, the capacity of human capacity or human workforce capacity, trained manpower in numbers, in different disciplines, and the infrastructure we do have for identifying or detecting pathogen at the source is still uh, limited. Also, the commitment of each sector to do uh, collaboratively and to, uh, to work on uh, uh, the detection surveillance uh, at a source level is still uh, questionable. Also, the political support we had for such kind of activities. So first, uh, we should have to have a commitment each sector, then uh, to strengthen this one, a political support should be uh, there to have uh, uh, such kind of uh, vigilant uh, surveillance. So the other thing is the financial supports. Uh, you, you, you know that uh, each sector have different uh, financial capacity, but uh, if there is a trend of uh, working together, collaborating, that was not a problem, but we are doing or uh, implementing things separately. So some sector have a challenge of finance, some has enough uh, uh, financial resource, but due to uh, lack of uh, coordination, they are not uh, doing what is expected from them. So I doubt that at, le at this level, we can detect pathogen at a source for the one else activity, but for a specific uh, sector, specific uh, pathogen detecting at a source, we can, but in collaborative way, uh, I don't think we are uh, able to identify now due to uh, the mentioned uh, challenges. The other you uh, raised question about the strengthening of awareness at uh, subnational level, even at the lower level. Currently, the National Awareness uh, Steering Committee is mandated to do is facilitating the multi-sectoral and collaboration and coordination at each level, just the facilitation. But all the things are done at that valley or village level. So we should have to uh, cascade this, the uh, activities that are staying at national level should go down to the regional level, uh, uh, regional even to the village level. So in my opinion, the work and all the activities are at regional level, but currently we are doing at national level, but, uh, with different projects like the Hill, uh, the core group project, like the John Hopkins University uh, Center for uh, uh, Center for Communication, uh, I think CCP, 
are uh, working at a uh, local level, at Kabani level. That must be uh, owned by the government and cascaded throughout all the regions because the, uh, the project funded are, they are specific with region and specific areas they are supporting, but the rest unsupported area are still idle. So the government should own this activity and work at each level. So I do believe that the, the activity should do at grassroots level, but currently still we are challenging that to create, but uh, we are uh, we are we have a planning to do these things at 2020, but due to Corona, we cannot uh, support the regional task force to have capacitated with this. So we are planning, but the thing should be done at that level. I do believe that one. So do I have another question? I have these no. two questions. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very I much miss... again, yeah, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, let, let's, let's, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laura, you have raised your hand. Oh, yes, sorry, the other one. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. yes, so um, thank you. I have a question for um, both speakers. Um, following up with what Dr. Mezaret just said, you had mentioned the need for establishing an actual One Health coordination structure um, considering the barrier that's often faced due to the lack of a joint funding mechanism, considering each sector has its own budget. Another barrier is the reluctance to share data despite established data sharing agreements. So what do you think would be the best way to move a, a coordination structure like this forward that would help get to overcome these barriers and potentially establish a maybe a joint multi-sectorial funding and data sharing mechanism. And I guess that's um, for, for both uh, speakers that could answer. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Masaret, you may start and then Dr. Laura. Okay, thank you, uh, Laura, it's a good uh, question. Uh, actually the best uh, solution for this challenge is to institutionalize national uh, uh, one health platform structure or coordination mechanism at uh, country level. Actually, I didn't mention in my presentation, uh, the national one health steering committee already prepared the organogram of this uh, one health platform, but we are uh, due to this corona, we left to advocate to the higher official like the parliament and the ministry level to uh, advocate the One Health uh, issue and so that to institutionalize the uh, One Health platform. So having an, an institutionalized uh, One Health structure at the country will solve everything, the data sharing, everything. So my reflection is this, if I get your question. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. That that's perfect. Um, so it's uh, it's something that I guess you're saying is in development um, in regard to moving it forward to continue maybe to get the the funding mechanism, the data sharing. That's something that um, I guess. What is the best way to continue moving it forward um, with our policymakers? And I guess that then it gets it back to um, communication with our policymakers, but. Any any recommendations for how to keep things moving forward, I guess, is my question. You mean that uh, advocating at higher level so that to get supported financially and politically? So. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that sort of answers the question as well. Yeah. Actually, uh, this advocacy is already in our plan in the National One Health Steering Committee annual plan. We plan this activity, but due to uh, the current situation in Ethiopia, all the higher officials, ministers are focusing on the election. So we planned this activity, but we are focusing to advocate One Health, their importance and uh, getting any funded and any uh, activity related with this to get uh, political will. So we have planned that activity, that advocacy one. Excellent, thank you. And 
It, it looks like Dr. Khan has actually just provided two wonderful articles that discuss that exact issue as well and how there's a need for that here in the United States as well. So thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Khan. Yeah, so um, thank you for your question. Yes, I've long advocated the need for a One Health department, if you will, um, that, that integrates human, animal, and plant, environmental, and ecosystem health, uh, recognizing the linkages between them. Uh, and in the article that I posted, the first one about the need for a new agency, if you look at the budgets that we, the, the amount of money that we spend comparatively between the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, if you look at how much funding we actually dedicate to these, to the One Health pie, if you will, we spend about we spend um, about a uh, trillion dollars on the Department of Health, ninety percent of which goes to health insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, treating disease, um, and of the rest, uh, about thirty three bill thirty three billion go to the National Institutes of Health to study human disease. Um, the amount of money that we spend for on public health, for example, CDC, FDA, is a tiny fraction of that. Uh, and if you look at the amount of money spent on um, nutrition, uh, agriculture, uh, you know, the, the budget is, is tiny. So if you look at agriculture, the environment, uh, you know, uh, HHS is about eight times more than the combined budgets of the other, pro, you know, departments and agencies, 90% of which is going to health insurance. And so that's, <laughs> that's really skewed to just treating, you know, end stage or advanced disease uh, without looking at the whole upstream drivers of, well, why are people getting sick? Unhealthy diet, unhealthy environment, um, you know, all of these factors that are just being ignored. Uh, but that's where our priorities are. Uh, similarly, in the next article, uh, you know, we need to reassess what we value in society. Do we value a healthy, you know, country, you know, healthy soil, healthy water, healthy air? Um, when we uh, measure the wealth of a country, we're only measuring the wealth of economic output or, you know, the GDP, the gross domestic product of the widgets that, you know, companies are producing. But is that really the true wealth of a country? Shouldn't we also be putting in the, uh, the natural resources, the, the quality of our of our water, the purity of our air, all of those things must be factored in if we are to truly assess our wealth. And this needs to be done at a national level. And so cumulatively, it can be built up at an international level so that each country makes these their priorities rather than our current skewed priorities of just making stuff, um, which is unsustainable. So I will, I will leave it at that. And, and, and the challenge though is getting the public to sign on uh, and to try to have an equitable economic system for everybody to have a decent quality of life and education. And, and you know, it's very hard to achieve these things when you've got people who are really struggling just to survive. So we have a very long ways to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I try not to get too depressed and too pessimistic, but, you know, we really have no choice if we want to try and uh, have a sustainable civilization globally. Thank you so much. These are excellent, excellent answers. Very, very helpful. Um, and I mean, it sounds like, you know, behavioral change is, again, one of the, the big things that um, we're going to face moving forward. 
Um, kind of to add to my question then for Dr. Khan, um, are you familiar with the recently introduced Senate bill, the Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act? Mm -hmm. And what do you think about that, I guess? I mean, I think it's a good start. Uh, again, I would like to see things much further. Than yeah, that. yeah. I mean, you know, I'm proposing a whole restructuring of government, yeah. and I've been told that that requires too much political capital and that there's no interest. You know, after 9 11, we usually, after a crisis, you restructure, you reshuffle the federal bureaucracy as a way to show the public that something's actually being done. Uh, the restructuring of the federal government after 9-11 uh, was the Department of Homeland Security, and that has created a whole slew of new problems. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't really the answer that we were hoping for. Um, and, you know, and I've been told there are other ways that we can try and achieve, achieve this. So um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, it remains to be seen uh, how far we can get but uh, we have a long ways to go. Okay, great. Thank you, Yeah, and certainly agree with, with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, both yeah, Dr. Laura and Dr. Laura. Let, let's give the floor for Professor Wang to reflect and to say something. You raised your hand, Professor Wang. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry, I um, was pulled off for a phone call, but when I raised my hand, I think Dr. Laura Khan had actually um, went over the answer. Essentially, it was how you were stating, never let a crisis go to waste. And I was just thinking, you had given us so many um, different aspects, like a lot, like Dr. Gettin within this hour, but I was trying to think of what is the next step moving forward? And you kind of in your other answers have outlined you know, some of those, um, but maybe to kind of juxtaposition into a different thing. You had kind of mentioned we need healthy people, healthy animals. So in looking at like the healthy people or the millennial goal objectives, like what do you think is the most um, pertinent or important next step that we can go forth and maybe have an achievable, sustainable outcome, like in your, um, in your opinion? Well, I'm a big supporter of education. Um, certainly, uh, raising public awareness. Uh, one Health Day uh, is, is one such example. You can have local One Health programs to get the, the public engaged in these things and interested. Uh, I think starting at the schools, getting kids uh, engaged, teaching them about it. I mean, this is going to be a generational thing. Uh, and I really think we need to start at a very young age to teach kids why they should care about the lives of other species and the environment and the ecosystems around them. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I think, starting at a very young age and getting their parents engaged <laughs> is, is a good way to go. Uh, I, you know, again, this is going to take generations. This isn't going to turn around anytime soon. When, whenever we want to make major societal changes, it takes time. Thanks. Just to follow up to that question in terms of education, as you kind of stated, yeah. the veterinary world seems to be much more embracing of this One Health concept, whereas in the medical world, we're not. And I think even with OSU, I think we're starting to teach kind of like the zoonotic having um, integrated it, um, teaching. Do you know, like, is there a movement amongst the US medical schools or other even global medical schools to kind of move a little bit in this direction? Because as you stated, healthy people needs to have a healthy animal, healthy planet, you know, health. So how do we, if it's not in that direction, how do we move in that direction? Well, I was heartened a couple months ago. I was approached by a One Health club at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine where the medical students were interested in this subject. So you're not gonna see it from the faculty because they're too far along in their career, they're set in their ways, but the students, the next generations coming up are the ones that are going to be making the change. So, you know, you, you, uh, we have to target the kids, um, we have to target the young through education, awareness, activities. Uh, again, that's where 
uh, the future lies is with them. And we really need to focus on that. Great. Thanks, Dr. Khan. And um, good afternoon, Dr. Mazaret. This is a question for you. I was very happy to see um, your discussion and how Ethiopia from the very high ministry level was taking um, action, you know, with the MOUs and um, et cetera. So I think my question for you is, as you guys are moving, and I know the initiative started in 2016, and then, you know, you were progressing, and then we got the pandemic. What do you see as your major challenge in moving this One Health platform forward, and what is the potential solution for that? Thank you, Shu. Dr. Masalat, yeah, you're Nice to yeah. meet you again. Yes, <laughs> we met before over in Jara. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the main challenge for uh, forwarding the National One and String Committee forward is uh, institutionalization of this uh, One and platform. So to do that, uh, there are uh, we need a support from the political support, the higher officials, even without institutionalized, if this steering committee are uh, uh, what if, uh, supported by uh, legal uh, higher official or politically, and if it is uh, funded by budget, we are uh, doing these activities, all these activities are by partners not the string committee doesn't have any source of budget. The source are the partners in the project. So if the government uh, recognize this national string committee and if it funds uh, resources, this uh, string committee, we can move forward. But if we are depending on others partners, it's difficult to forward. So institutionalization is important here because if we institutionalize, the government will budget that institution and it's overseen by the higher officials. So we will have a better result. So I think uh, this one is uh, the challenge yeah. is the financial issue. And Thank the solution yeah. is in Thanks very much. Thanks very much to uh, all the, yeah, I mean, the, our presenters and also those who were interacting by question. We are on top of the hour. Really appreciations. We have seen interactions on the chat box, question and answer. Thanks for asking, supplementing Dr. Sylvia Murphy and also a question from Abdallah. It was actually partly for Ohio State Global One Health Initiative. And just to say a few words for you, Dr. Abdallah, living in Somalia, Ohio State University Global One Health Initiative has got three major goals. One is research. The other one is training. The other one is outreach. While both our training and research now gone virtually can reach anywhere in the world, including Somalia, uh, we have to consider how to engage on the, the third piece, the research aspects. So we really appreciate that. And again, appreciations for all of you. And uh, Laura, back to you. Thanks very much again. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so um, do we have any questions and maybe have time for one more question? And if not, oh, we, all right. Um, yeah, I, I apologize. I, I actually have to you, go. No, no so, problem. We, we are at the hour. So yeah. thank you so much. We will go My ahead. Pleasure. And yeah. um, to both of our speakers. We hope you have a wonderful day. Much appreciated for your time and we will see everyone Thanks. next time. Yes. Thank you so much both yeah. Dr. Khan, Dr. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.